Will the college and complexes please come to order? Will the college and complexes please come to order? My name is Tim. I'll be moderating tonight along with Andy Anderson on the College of Complexes. The college consists of the following format. The first thing is our speaker will speak on the topic up to about an hour or so if they show choose. Afterwards, there'll be a question and answer period where we will have questions and then you will get answers from the speaker. And the third part will be our infamous rebuttal period where you get a chance to uh, sound off on or off topic about the speaker or anything that comes to your mind. There are two rules at the College of Complexes. The first one is one fool at a time. And second, no personal attacks. Why is a perfect society impossible? And author and activist Margaret Goldstein who says a perfect society is impossible because of the selfishness, selfishness in many aspects of our existence. Let's give a hand again to Margaret Goldstein. Why is a perfect society impossible? Okay, Margaret, the microphone is yours. And uh, let's give her another hand. All right, Margaret. Elect Bernie. How about the third day? Elect Bernie, we get a perfect party. Go ahead. To speak in what we all say. Yeah, the little Bill Moore. He's a Democrat. He's a Democrat. Perfect world. Yeah. The next day. Yeah. Elect Bernie. Elect Bernie. Okay. The sun is The sun is right in my eyes. The sun is shining. Yeah, I Okay. Why is a perfect society impossible? Because of the selfishness in many aspects of our existence. Uh, here's an idea. Perfection is impossible. You never get there. Nothing ever goes right for long. Why is that? Because people are hopelessly self-serving, focusing their actions on benefiting themselves only to the exclusion of everything and everyone else. I will give many examples, starting with one from my own personal experience. I live in a four-flat cooperative building which is part of a large development of such buildings. These buildings are ideal for modern income families. The idea is that each family shares equally in the upkeep of the building. Avoiding paying for landscapers and such, and monthly um, uh, assessments can be approximately $60. The people hear that $60. Uh, what has happened, however, is that in many buildings, only a few or none of the people do any work. Yards may be littered with trash, uncut grass, and multiple weeds. Back stairs are left unpainted and deteriorating. Um, trash you know, uh, can covers aren't closed, so we have a rat problem. You have to do a simple thing like closing the lid. Treasurers next need to go to great lengths to collect assessments. Some owners make a point of being unreachable. Making joint decisions is made difficult. 
Here's a perfect example of the selfishness goal of providing for one's own pleasure, that is, not exerting oneself to the exclusion of everything else. As for the general issue of affordable housing, and we know that's an issue, uh, besides better run co-op buildings, affordable uh, rental housing could be made available in expensive large cities by requiring large um, rent, uh, large rental buildings to set aside 10% of their units as affordable to the lowest 20% of earners. First floors of such buildings could and often are rented out to businesses, which do pay higher rent anyway. More money could be allocated for Section 8 rent vouchers with the requirement that a competent agency, and that does not include the Chicago Housing Authority, administer the vouchers. They cause a lot of problems. They, make, they botch up the program badly. Um, um, tenants uh, should be encouraged to continue um, sorry, by um, tenants uh, that could encourage continue provision of affordable housing or any rental housing by not trashing apartments as many, many do. Uh, getting landlords, government agencies, and tenants focused on solving the problem would, necessar would be necessary if we want to have affordable housing available. Our state and federal governments could solve many problems tomorrow if they focused on them. The federal government has a $21 trillion national debt, which could, until recent huge budget deficits, start to have been reduced by eliminating the $1 trillion a year loss in tax revenue to credit tax credits and tax deductions. This these are rarely reduced. Recently, the Republican tax legislation did deal with some of them. It did reduce some of them, which was very unusual. But the reason that they're usually not um, dealt with is because almost any attempt at reform uh, is uh, fought tooth and nail by the special interest groups who benefit from them, supported by members of Congress to whom they, they give campaign contributions. In fact, it is said that never give a benefit that you haven't thought through, that is, Congress or legislatures, because once you give the public this benefit, you cannot take it back. Programs such as college aid, including Pell Grants, which cost millions in taxpayer money, should be vetted for whether they are doing any good, or rather just causing the colleges to increase their tuitions even higher, as it is believed is the case. Some of the Pell Grant money is received by for-profit colleges which cheat students out of real, usable educations and are a scandal, and the Trump administration is, is taking away all the attempts by the Obama administration to regulate them. Food stamps now cost the federal government $81 billion a year. These should be reined in by limiting their use to nutritious foods and drinks. Um, and, and not allowing um, junk food and pop to be purchased with them. And limiting monthly allotments for families of four, for example, to $260 rather than $668. The United States Department of Agriculture, beholden to the money-mad food industry, limits the ability of local governments to screen students for eligibility for free school lunches and won't allow local governments to limit food stamps to nutritious foods. Despite rising obesity with its related medical costs and a broke government, the selfish food industry focuses on making money at the expense of the of society and the taxpayers. 
there was there's also been an unreasonable increase in the number of recipients from 17 million in 2000 to 47 million in 2013. Uh, this was um, granted. This was prompted by the financial crisis. But once prosperity had returned, why didn't the people cover the families or whatever covered by food stamps go back to what they originally were? Taxpayers' money shouldn't be spent on child care. So irresponsible women can enter motherhood. Encouraging new mothers to take jobs before their children reach school age takes jobs away from vulnerable men and encourages these women to have children out of wedlock. Yes. It is a known fact that children of single mothers fare much worse than children with fathers. It's a known fact. You can read it all the time, newspapers. We need to also consider that the daycare environment does not allow the bonding with a parent that enhances a child's a child emotionally. The selfish interest pushing child care, amongst others being the democratic politicians, looking only to get votes and not giving a hoot about anything except their own self-advancement. Getting re-elected in this country is all that matters to politicians. It's all that matters. People would not be running to the government for hundreds for handouts as much if they would learn to manage their money better. Our savings rate has been going down and had fallen to 2.4% recently, went up a little. A survey found that 70% of respondents said they could save more money or save money, but they don't choose to do so. A, a recommended goal for responsible money management is to spend, and I don't say this would work for everybody, but this is just a thought here, 50% of your income on necessities, 30% for um, uh, wants, and 20% for savings. And don't tell me this can't be done because I have done it on a moderate income and it can be done. And don't throw that argument at me because it's not valid to say. Anyone that's not, that's even has a job at least could save something. It is not necessary for people to be shot dead in their tracks by strangers wielding rapid-firing assault weapons with no, which are prototypes of weapons used in war, produced for civilians and produced, and they're based on something used in war, uh, pressured by the NRA, which receives millions in donations from gun manufacturers. Congress refuses to reinstate the assault weapon ban, which we had until the 1990s. Although the Constitution says Congress should provide for the common good. The common good. Are they? No, of course. All they're providing for is themselves and getting reelected. Getting reelected is the only thing that matters to the Congress, legislators, any of these foolish politicians. It doesn't matter that normal people, the innocent people getting back to the gun issue, are shot dead in for, for no reason. Just so that these selfish people can get their own way and get their reelected and rank in the money. It's unconscionable. Yes, we could have at least a somewhat more perfect world with affordable housing, governments that are not broke, and that spend money wisely, Food practices that don't make people fat, better adjusted children with fathers and parental care during their formative years, more financially secure families, and safety from more killings. But because of the self-centering behavior, our self-centering behavior, we can't get these things. And we can't get it for the society just gets worse and worse, in my opinion. Yeah.
you still got some. All right. Is that, is that it, Andre? Yes. All right. Let's uh, get ready to start with questions. Start with questions. I'll give you the first one. Margaret, I'm a. Uh, isn't there a difference between self-interest and selfishness? Adam Smith put that the interest of the individual was paramount, and that could include the benefits of giving to somebody else because he gets a little re reference out of it, but selfishness was decided as disregarding the rights of the other individual. Could you comment? Self interest. I mean, of course, you have you to. You want to use the mic? Of course, you have to uh, consider your needs, but I think it's saying that your self interest should be constrained by the effect of what you do on another person. I mean, maybe some woman thinks it's in her self interest to be working for four years and never stop. <laughs> And maybe that's the first thought that comes to mind. But it's selfish if she doesn't constrain it by, yeah, maybe my kid needs me around for a few years. Um, I mean, we do have self-interest, and we all do, and that's where we start, but you've got to rein it in before it is so destructive. Okay. Next question, please. Go Dave, ahead. Dave? David Rubin, a friend of the Goldsteins for a long time, and um, now this this might be a bad digression, but um, it's all right. It, it's question time. When, um, in a situation where we have a leader who says um, it might be treasonous to um, please speak up to that uh, in a in a situation where we have a leader who says it might be treasonous not to applaud him at the State of the Union address, and the same leader who calls um, a, a duly elected U.S. Senator by a 200-year-old Indian name, we, uh, do we have any hope for any of these things to actually change in the next two years? And, and, I, and apologies if this is way too partisan. Well, I mean, Trump is an aberration. You know that. I mean, I don't think we Truman's have to say... Truman's an aberration? You mean Trump? Aberration. <laughs> no, truth, I think so. Oh, truth. What? I'm sorry, I didn't listen. You're talking about Trump? Truth. You refer to Trump's comments. Of course. Yeah, of course. yeah, okay, all right. So anyway, uh, he's not exactly uh, normal. <laughs> and we certainly... I, mean, I don't think the... This, we're going to the dogs just because we have some crazy person like that in there. So I mean, obviously everything he says is, is ridiculous. And, and I wouldn't give up hope on society because there's this one man who's completely nuts, you know. I, I do say this, I mean, if we do, I tell you what, he wouldn't be in office if we had gotten rid of the Electoral College. As many good government people have been trying to it get this done for many years because as everyone knows Clinton did win two million more votes than Trump so this would never happen and my, to my amazement after this happening nobody's still nobody gives a hoot about the Electoral College now that's where you would begin if you're upset with Trump start with getting rid of the Electoral College wouldn't that also have been true Can loud please well if, if Gore won same thing. Uh, okay. So you know why our history would have been so much better if Gore had won the election, I mean, been given the election according to the majority vote that he did. We wouldn't have had Iraq. We wouldn't have had the financial crisis. We wouldn't have had 9/11. This that's the best argument yet for getting rid of the election. Look at the damage this country sustained because we don't have fair elections. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, Margaret, your basic premise is we do not have a perfect society. But the last time I looked, 
millions of children go to school, millions of children go on to higher education, millions of people get health care, millions of people have transportation, they can take to different parts of the city of the United States. So I don't really understand this. These ha things happen, right. but they're and so... And you talk about, you gave me an example about your back fence isn't painted. <laughs> that, that's your proof that the country isn't running right? I'm trying to illustrate the point. It's, it's not that people aren't educated or living in, in the roof over their head and, and that. It's that the way things are done. I spoke there about college education. The federal government funds these colleges without thinking twice, including the nonprofit colleges. It's the way things are done. Yes, there, we do have a lot. You're right, and, and, and we have uh, we're probably yeah, we're one of the luckiest countries in the world. Yeah. But we're not making the best of it. And we could have a better situation, and we could have more comfortable old ages, and we could have happier kids and the whole thing if we thought about the other guy and not just ourselves. Well, never mind. I better leave it Charlie, have we got time? That's the best thing you're saying. Well, Hey, not to minimalize it, but, you know, this stamp, food stamp issue was, I'm sorry, not the top of my list of crisis things that need to be corrected. If people aren't purchasing what you deem to be the right thing in a supermarket to have for dinner tonight. You know, I... Uh, two things. Obesity, major health problem in this country and the national debt. Spending the money, you know, whether it's uh, um, those Pell Grants, or whether it's food stamps, or whatever it is, or the, definitely the Pentagon, that's a real, you know, but I mean, any extra spending, you know, somebody, our people's, not the people here, but children and grandchildren of them are going to have to deal with this debt someday. So the Is that two, fair? The two examples you cited, and I'll leave it at that, are feeding people who are hungry and educating people who aren't, who need an education, who aren't wealthy to attend. And you complaining about this? That to me, that's money well spent. As a matter of fact, I wish we could double the amount of money we're spending on that. I'm nothing against I'm feeding Charlie, people. Charlie, have you ever been to Haiti? Do you know what goes on in Haiti? That's where you find people going hungry. Not the United States. This is baloney. It's baloney. It's the food industry. And you know, it, you being against capitalism, I should think you'd really be interested in this issue because it's the capitalist food industry that's pushing this whole thing and sending donations to Congress to get them to vote for all this food stamp spending. It's the food industry. It's not just the politicians, but it's what, you know, of course, they, they just, you know, want campaign donations. But it's a horror, and I should think just like the Pentagon and the military industrial complex pushing military spending. They're pushing it to line their own pockets. It's nothing to do with helping this country. So you, yes. okay, go ahead, Raj. Raj. Here? Go ahead. Comment. Do you have any comment about Obama government eight years? Uh, I'm sorry, about Obama what? <laughs> about, about what? Do you, have a, do you have a comment? What do you think about Obama government? About Obama doing what? What do you think about his what do you think about Obama? Mark, no, hand him the mic. Hand him the mic. Just walk over and hand him the mic for a minute. That way we can keep it up. That's okay. Just, just take it, keep, grab the mic. Uh, what do you think about the last eight years of Obama government? How did he do? And the problems you are, you are indicating, did he try to solve them? Okay, and second question is that, what do you think about uh, uh, Trump? Is he doing a good job in economics? Thank you. I think Obama was relatively good. He did have his faults. He's very, he was very good on the environment. And of course, he wanted to do something about global warming, which Trump is undoing. 
Uh, so that's a, a bad thing about Trump. I mean, Trump is against the environment, and Obama is very much for it. Uh, Obama, however, was a spendthrift. A typical Democrat wanted to hand out money here and there. And a thing I always will fault him for is originally we had, you want to have taxpayer-funded elections to get a special interest out. So we did have taxpayer-funded presidential elections until Obama came. He scorned it and he went out and raised all his extra money so now that's become the norm instead of depending on the taxpayers paying it without any special interest. So I do fault Obama for that. Um, there's some other things I to say. The environment, well, foreign policy was good. Um, um, just can't think of every detail right now of what he uh, did. But obviously Trump is, there's very little that Trump does is good. I mean, he's, and he's, he's so much against the environment. It's, it's sickening. Uh, he wants, he wanted to increase the armaments spending. He's, he's uh, just, you know, his foreign policy is terrible. He's, he trashes our own allies. He's he, he just a, a, a mess. I mean, it's just almost nothing good I can say about him. It's just terrible. It's tragic. Making America great again. Hey, he's making America great again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, on the food stamps, that's right, actually right now up in debate is because it's part of the farm bill. You have the, the congressional version is putting on a work requirements for food stamps and the Senate version does not want them. But right now that's that's being debated in Congress right now with the farm bill. I understood that thing about requ a work requirement was up to every, in the, in each state. You know, it's not a requirement, it's not an absolute necessity, but that's kind of an issue and I'm not even sure about that. But I do know you say it's part of the farm, the Department of Agriculture. This, yeah, the, the, and so what the special interest groups, I'm telling you, are in there. General Mills or whatever, those, you know, those food companies pushing for all this spending on food stamps. That's not because they give a hoot about anybody. Just well, what do you think is going to be in the farm bill? It's going to be, you're going to have ADM and Monsanto in there. Please. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not, told, I'm not saying don't have food stamps. I'm saying get it under control. You know what's wrong with this country? Everything is overdone. It's overkill. Can't we moderate these things? You know, they used to say everything in moderation, nothing in excess. Well, this country's going overboard on everything. You have to be active right now because it's right now up in debate. You only got a short time before one version or another is going to be passed. Well, I tell you, I I write regularly. I have two, two presidents and um, senators and representatives, and I've certainly brought this issue up. It's, it's a terrible waste of uh, taxpayer money. But uh, who am I against the food industry? You know, I mean, it's just nothing you can do. Then, which I shouldn't say that because I believe in activism, but. It's, it's, I don't oh, the agriculture department's always been full of pork. All uh, right, okay. Uh, well, okay. what part of government's not? Well, I, I don't know that the Department of Education is. or. or, or <coughs> it's full of pork, too. I like bacon. What's the problem? <laughs> I'm a sausage man question? myself. How many questions have you had? Yeah, here, here's... Hey, Margaret. Um, so you're blaming Obama for what Republicans did. The Republicans started spending way over that limit that was um, the uh, presidential candidate could opt to uh, take money from the federal government for the elections. But the Republicans are the ones that blew the data. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Doc, but I, I just don't agree with you. Republicans are the ones that <laughs> caused I, I, Obama I have to, to, just, have to uh, go fund that limit after I, I they'd already really broken it. Remember reading at the time that Obama was the one that was breaking the pattern, yeah. and he was the one that set the pattern. You see, once you start doing something like that, then everybody else follows. It's like you enable people. Yeah. You see, because Obama you, had to do it because of the Republicans. Well, that I don't, I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, about the deficit. Uh, the deficit is being created large, enlarged greatly by the Republicans this time. Yes. You're not calling, you're not blaming the right people. 
Oh, I'm not blaming you. Listen. As if it happened in, out of the air or something. Doug, I'm against all politicians. I don't care what they call themselves. Oh. Where are you? Yes. Uh, you have identified one of the major items, which is selfishness. And you're talking about symptoms. But the real core and what you need to change is people's hearts. If you don't change people's hearts, nothing else will work. And what are your plans to change people's hearts? I say this is a heart thing because love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. That's all we're saying. What, 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 uh, how do you do other artists you would have done unto you? That's all I'm saying. Start attending church and synagogue. What? Start attending church and synagogue. Yeah. Now, no, no, no. That's, that's got nothing to do. This has nothing to do with religion. We're talking about ethical standards. That's exactly correct. Where do you start them? You have look for an ethical standard. As I said, everybody knows the golden rule. Yes. Do you want to know what's under your head, under yourself? Just follow that. That's not revolutionary. That's we know. Do you have the golden rule? Yes. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that on the brochure, it said something about why no system will ever work perfectly uh, because there's too much selfishness. Right. Selfishness is what capitalism is based on. Yes. And as Tim pointed out, Adam Smith said that everyone working in their own self-interest makes the country great. Yeah. So how can you stand there and say that selfishness is the reason why it doesn't work? Uh, it's not true that every... It's I've given so many examples how going out for yourself is destructive. Of course you have to, there's a difference between capitalism and communism, and yes, you have to have the incentive there that capitalism gives you to get out and start a business and do that stuff. And in fact, there are countries that are so difficult, undeveloped countries that don't develop because there's so many barriers to people getting out and starting businesses. So yes, but um, the um, Anyway, but uh, the, the point is that you can do both. Well, as I said, answered another question here. You think of yourself self-interest to start with, but rein it in. Bring, bring it. Uh, consider what's going on around you. Don't, you know, mow down everybody else just because you want to have an assault weapon. Does everybody else's life have to be threatened? <coughs> Okay. How many? How many more? Do we have other questions? Yes, Jean. Uh, Margaret, I think you kind of can find your comments to the United States, and you may want to stay with that. But in your experience, have you heard of some other countries? There are what 190 countries or something that uh, does a little better job than the United States? I kind of thought so um, when I had, I read some things about the Netherlands and Germany, and, and well, right now Germany is really bad with some of the right-wingers, but until recently, under Merkel, she seems like a very good head of a, I wouldn't mind having a Merkel as the head of our government, but they, she's um, very sensible um, uh, fiscal policies in Germany, and they wanted to, um, not having budget deficits, very practical and sensible, I thought. And the things are getting rocky over there now, I realize. And um, the country, if I were to live in another country besides the United States, hmm, I would say any other country that would be an improvement would be Canada. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like you to comment on the following, Margaret, uh, if you don't mind. This, this is something I've thought of for a long time. 
that in the end we do good things for others because it makes us happy to do them. In the end we do get something out of it, even if it's just something as basic as the other of Perpin's happiness. I really like these posts. What do you think? Isn't it intrinsically selfish to do good for others to make yourself feel good as well? You're the most under. Yeah, so, yeah, I was thinking of how to express it. Um, the most, uh, yeah, it, it's that, like you say, you're, you're, you're enhancing yourself. You're a happier person if you're unselfish. If you're giving and you're seeing, you know, it's a, it's a pleasurable thing. I don't think super selfish, I don't think Trump is happy or these other the military industrial How could they be happy? How, how can the, um, the uh, gun industry, how can those people be happy? You're sickles. Huh? Sickles. You're sickles. Sickles. Cycles. 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 But I mean, the, the, the point of the thing is, what this person online is saying is that it's selfish still to do good for others and derive pleasure from it. Well, if you're doing it just for selfish reasons, but the thing is normally if you're unselfish, if your acts are unselfish, you're doing it for unselfish because you want to improve things. I mean, the normal thing is to say this situation is wrong. I care. I care about children having fathers or whatever, and you, you say something and speak up. Uh, it's. I don't think you're doing it just because it to be feel good about yourself. You, you just you do it because it needs to be done. Aren't you kind of? confusing then it's in the self-interest of that person to do good rather than being selfish yeah. there's a difference between self-interest and selfishness is what you're I think you're trying to say correct well you said that self-interest um, you start with self-interest it's normal but you Lane it in before it gets to the point where people are being shot at by assault weapons. You know what I mean? You, you have to, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? You have to, and I can't think of the word for this. Being Besides raining it in, you. Paradox. Are we finished? Somebody else? I got another question. Okay. okay. Take some other questions. Yes. yes. I'm sorry, Margaret. I just killed you. There's a good PBS special on about Dayton, Ohio, and uh, that's running. It's really well done. And um, clearly, globalization's been a complete failure. Oh, what? Uh, the, uh, what? Uh, you know, the big companies in Wall Street left Dayton. Huge unemployment rate, opioid problems. Um, NAFTA was a bad idea. I, I kind of agree with Trump. With that, WTO with China, we lost so many good union jobs paying well with good benefits, and the service economy that they sold us 20 years ago has turned into a failure. The serv remember that? So we're going to be a service economy, whereas we lost all these quality jobs. Uh, my answer to that is the great assault weapon is good for the greatest number. Uh, factory jobs affected a small percentage, of, uh, including my husband. He went, he lost three factory jobs. I lost two. But he, yeah. But but it's the greatest good globalization, and the, and the whole and it's gotten out of hand at times. Benefited the world. It's because of globalization that countries like China and Indonesia are not still peasant societies but have a, a standard of living approaching ours. We in the West have no right to say we're the only ones to have a right to a good standard of living. The whole world should have it. It's a failure. Globalization did that. Okay. Yeah. Charlie. All right. All right, uh, All right Charlie. I just, I just read, Margaret, that the uh, CEO compensation figures are that the rich are getting richer 
especially with the tax cuts uh, of the Republican Party. And yet you come along and you say the real problem are the entitlements that the poor, poor needy get to send their kids to school. That's not entitlement. Or to, or to, or to have some, some grub to eat for dinner, have something for dinner. I, you, you want to change society, and yet are you attacking the very, why are you attacking the poor and needy? And then first of all, about the rich and greedy. Charlie, in the first place, I'm as upset as anybody is about the CEO pay. It's outrageous and it's crazy. And all that started with George W. Bush cut the, the uh, taxes for the wealthy, setting the pattern that all these wealthy people, we owe them, a, and that was very bad. It's another terrible thing that that man who was, wouldn't be there if we did not have the Electoral College. And all the destruction he did. But the CEO, but the point I try to make, and I, I think we we're, we're go overboard in this thing about talking about wealthy people. Okay, so we're all annoyed. Let's get on with our lives. Let's manage our own money so we can live comfortably. And we can, and I, I'm a perfect proof of it because I've always lived in a moderate income and I live comfortably, but you manage your money. And that's what you should stress. Wait, wait Forget the wait CEO. Wait we have people, no control over There are there. people living like princes, and you're telling me manage my economy? Hey, you manage never your money. Hey, I'm going to give you a golden rule. Take from the rich and give to the poor. You know, doesn't you ever think of that? What? I'm supposed to manage my money? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Poor person. I could be poor. And you get up there and say, oh, poor manage poor your money. Poor. Well, there's some good money. Yeah, that's ridiculous. You're a microphone. 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 There's wealthy people who want to set that percent. And I'm supposed to all manage your money. I think we go overboard. There's nothing we can do about these CEOs. It's terrible and it's awful. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's and it's nothing. 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 Hand him the mic, I Margaret. Like I wonder, um, <laughs> I wonder, Margaret, because they're if, lucky. If, that's why. If I have my history correct, <laughs> that the let's let's hear the question, please. Let's count the uh, let's count mm -hmm. down the. If Margaret happens to know the answer to this, I wonder if I have my history correct that the electoral college was founded in part as a compromise um, in order to to somehow deal with the issue of slaves and their representation and and somehow the, the three-fifths factor that everyone knows about was involved with this and then somehow or other Mr. Benjamin Franklin who we all would seem to admire so much was also involved with that. Do I have my history correct and is this relevant? I don't know. I'm sorry, Dave. I, my understanding was it was a big state versus small state issue, and the small state somehow benefit from this. That's what I understand. I haven't studied it in detail. I just know it's a, we've got to get rid of it. The, it. the idea was that masses have many heads, but no, they were fearful of the masses electing the president. So they put this thing in the step back in there that there'd be elected representatives who choose the president. And they didn't want to have direct election of the president because they were fearful of what they called the mob. 
Exactly. <laughs> so you have a second vote. You have to you elect electors. And uh, the electors are supposedly independent. Yes. But they're not because they vote automatically. Okay. Something like the small states get more more electors than the big states. No. I think it's the total number of senators and congressmen they have, isn't it? Yes, I believe you're right. Is that what it is? It doesn't come with sandwiches. Okay. Margaret, are you up for more questions or do you want us to go to rebuttals? Who else has a question for Margaret? Make sure it is. Or a solution. Anyone have a solution? Not allowed to have a question. Okay. Well, Margaret, it looks like we may be going into rebuttals a little early. Let us uh, applaud Margaret for giving us some proof of thought. Just stick it right in there, Margaret. And now let's get into rebuttals. I'm not going to ask how many people are speaking. We still got a lot of time, so we'll live. Just we'll we'll go with a well we can go into about a five minute rebuttal period each. So let's uh, let's uh, we'll limit the remarks to about five minutes, and uh, let's get up there. Are you there. ready to order, hun? Are you are you? Did you want to Who's got who wants to speak on the rebuttals tonight? Oh, so get up there. Let's go. Coke, coffee. Go ahead. All right, we're gonna make the, we're gonna limit it to about five minutes each. No, he'll probably want to take eight or nine, but uh, yeah. we got a little bit of time tonight, so please, again, I'm going to ask if you get up there to rebut, please make your comments clear and coherent so that we don't have a lot of rambling on and on. Please, go right ahead. Can we hear you? Uh, we started with, a, uh, with the idea of the Electoral College was that the most people in the most states would elect the president because some states have a very sparse population and other states have a, a very, very uh, dense population. So they wanted to make it fair for all the for, for the whole country. So in order to do that, they made it so that the most people in the most states would elect the president. And that's why they came to that. Any chance of ever doing away with the uh, Electoral College is very, very doubtful at best. So you might as well forget about that. Now, this country, I don't know about uh, other countries. I'm not as concerned with other countries. But in this country, we, we operated on the basis that Adam Smith said, people working in their own interests <coughs> wind up benefiting the country the most. As Anne Rand pointed out in, in one of her books, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Anne Rand, yes. but she said, uh, for instance, a Greek comes to this country and he opens up a restaurant and he winds up going back to Greece after 40 years with a million dollars. And people say, why that no good so-and-so made all his money here, and then he goes back to Greece to spend it. But the, the truth of the matter is, in order for him to make that million, he had to benefit the electric company, the gas company, the landlord of his building. Uh, he had to buy his food, uh, and he had to do advertising. He had to pay his help. So for that Greek to have made his million dollars over 40 years, he made an awfully lot of other people very well off. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that is why that people working in their own self-interest 
benefits the nation as a whole because you cannot engage in any business where you don't benefit other people. Even a bank robber has to have a getaway car. Thank you. Yeah, the Greek, uh, Greek owner retires. What happened to the people who worked there? I'm meeting this with Bill. Yeah. I think it's a shame. Okay, Jamie, I'm the next. I guess nobody's here, so uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about uh, three things. Uh, uh, Margaret mentioned other countries. Uh, we talked about people who are down and out. That's not. Oh, you can't see me. Okay, I'll try again. Um, Mark, uh, I'm going to talk about three things. Of course, I th forgot the third thing already. Uh, talk about people who are down and out. Uh, oh, the Electoral College and uh, other countries. The Electoral College, as I recall, check my history. I think uh, Rutherford uh, B. Hayes, uh, George W. Bush, um, and I think one other uh, were uh, selected because of uh, they got less votes, but more electoral uh, votes. And Trump. Uh, uh, I have to say that I never wrote a letter until January of last year against the Electoral College. So I guess I don't have much to complain about. But to me, it's a lousy system. The idea that uh, there's a state that you you can... Well, if you're a left-winger uh, and you want democracy, you ought to go to Vermont. I mean, I, I suppose that's an answer, sort of. Uh, but I think the Electoral College should be knocked out, but I don't think it... I think it's almost impossible that it will be. Uh, other countries, Margaret mentioned uh, Germany and Canada. Uh, the Netherlands also, I forgot that. Uh, the Netherlands I can't comment, but I agree that Angela Merkel, even though she's way to the right of me, think about it a little bit, Germany went from Hitler to Angelo Merkel. We went from FDR to Trump. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Trudeau, uh, he's still way to the right of me, but um, I, I should have said Angela Merkel's way to the right of me. Uh, but Trudeau is certainly uh, better, in my opinion, way better than our guy. I only met one person recently from Canada. That was two years ago. And I said, you want to trade? And he said, yes. He was, if we were in Florida. He was a rich guy from Canada. And he didn't like the idea that Trudeau was taxing to Okay, long, so. spend six minutes, Gene, but that's okay. That was six minutes? I'm sorry, maybe I didn't. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, the third thing, I'll try to get this in a minute. Usually I talk short. Uh, the third thing is anybody who's on the uh, bottom or down and out, I think we ought to take care of them. I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. If somebody is rich and I don't like them, 
Well, that's okay, but they better pay their taxes. Oh, yeah. Hey, Gene, I made an error. I'm no, sorry. Gene. I made an error. I, I, somebody forgot to start the clock when oh, you spoke. Okay. So that's my fault. My apologies. We're going to go a little longer. Okay. When you're ready. There's one thing we have tonight, and that's plenty of time. Uh, but yeah. I'm not going to take a lot of it. Uh, I um, don't want to beat up on Margaret too much here. I got the impression she was kind of all over the map, um, sort of inconsistent. And I wanted to ask her maybe just what exactly her political philosophy was. Um, but it seems like she is pragmatic. I think that's probably what she would say. Um, and um, I don't want to um, categorize her or something. I think there's too much of that going on. But um, we, um, um, we came here thinking we were going to hear about why a society couldn't be perfect. And uh, I was looking for more things that weren't just so bogged down with how our society is now. Um, so I was looking for a more idealistic kind of uh, discussion, um, more even maybe science fiction-y. Uh, but um, um, I do think that uh, we are, you know, we are in a national emergency, and I bring that up a lot. Um, but uh, looking forward, um, hoping that this is an anomaly. Um, I think did you use that word with respect to Trump? Um, so I think we're in agreement about that. I think um, um, we don't want to declare a victory, but we see him falling apart. So um, the hope is is that we won't do, do much destruction on the way down. Nixon was a great danger on the way down. And he was talking to pictures in the, you know, in the Lincoln bedroom and stuff. You know, and I guess they, I wish Lincoln's ghost had told him, you know, uh, and something what to do what the right thing is. But um, that didn't happen apparently. But he did at least uh, get told by Barry Goldwater to get lost. Uh, I don't know who's going to tell Trump to get lost, but uh, if Mueller uh, does indict his two kids and. Uh, uh, that, that might be a thing for him to plea bargain out of the White House. But uh, let's not count our chickens too much, but uh, looking forward, what kind of a size society would we go towards is to make a better society, and I think uh, we have to go in the, in the way of um, uh, using pragmatics, we have to go in the way of things that work, that worked in our other countries, we we'll have to go to single payer health care. Um, hopefully, there won't be too much damage when the Republicans have completely removed Obamacare and people are going back to dying, you know, in large numbers because they can't get health insurance in a reasonable amount. But a perfect society is not really completely possible. But I once thought about it as in the far future, as like in Isaac Asimov and um, those other uh, visionaries of science fiction. And uh, at some point, we are going to have to maybe depend on AI. Uh, we have uh, become to the point where we're on the verge of, of AI. And uh, we must make sure that um, artificial intelligence is not evil. That's going to be difficult. And I once uh, brought that up in a play I wrote um, in 1989. It was produced in 1991 uh, at the Avenue Theater. I sometimes bring it up, only when it's germane to the issue here. Um, but in that case, um, the artificial intelligence program, I perceived what things might be like if the program uh, sought to uh, work on behalf of humanity and what we would ethically consider good. You know, not what these crazy people that have um, taken power temporarily uh, consider good, but uh, ethical good that um, uh, we would equate with uh, the better instincts of Christianity, which is to work for the poor, which Jesus said to do, uh, which is to try to uplift people and not um, divide them and break them down. Um, and um, if, if we have um, AI that's intelligent and, uh, well, it would be intelligent, <laughs> that would be a death by definition, um, and ethical, ethical AI, um, we may have a better chance because one of the things that could happen is, is that people like Trump, um, psychopaths like him and, and his ilk, and people in this giant swamp, um, they will not be allowed to get to that point if we do have um, ethical AI because ethical AI will ferret out these wrongdoers long before they reach this level. Of, uh, and, and so we will be closer to um, a perfect society. We may not be able to have one. A lot will go into 
um, the structure and the um, and what we um, report, you know, what we put in as the goals of our AI. Um, and um, uh, when we have robots that are working, and hopefully they will have things like um, the great visionary uh, Isaac Asimov said that the three laws of robotics that help protect humanity and individual humans. And there were problems because he wrote about them back in the 60s, 50s and 60s. He saw, foresaw these things that are coming to place now, that are coming into uh, fruition that we'll have to deal with. But we will be able to have a much better society if we are partners with the AI and if we have an AI that's ethical and that works on our behalf. And that's a, that's a heavy lift. But that's what we will have to be focusing on uh, during this bringing down of Trump and the, and the other fascists. What's the AI stand for? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought everybody knew that. It's, no. But uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence. They, um, you know, um, they're going to be giving drones the ability to fire on, on human beings and make decisions about who to kill. And this is a problem. We are going to have some AI that's going to be um, doing things that are very questionable questionable ethically and um, um, from the military and they will not be treated, they will not be given that um, um, training or um, nudge to become ethical. So we have to be, you know, we really have, are going to have to be on our toes about this. And I, I just am sorry to be so gentle about it and I probably went way over my time. All right. But, uh, that's uh, one of the things we're going to about for a perfect society. We'll never be able to get completely there, but you, you try are, to get close. You're at five minutes, 45 seconds. I must have been way over. Okay. Raj, when you're ready. Raj Patel. I, I did not realize it was about a political thing. I thought it was a general subject about society. But uh, anyway, <coughs> the, in the way life evolved from very simple form, there was always a this struggle to, be, to eat or to be eaten. And uh, there was a competition, and that created the evolution. Evolution happened because there was no perfection. It's a dog eat dog world. And, uh, and uh, from that, human beings came. And uh, it is so inbred in our DNA. It can be very difficult for any society to be perfect or to follow a moral dictate of one side or other side. Because uh, how to say that uh, Trump is not better than Obama in some areas, and it's, it's not how to say that Trump is very bad guy. I mean, I mean, uh, is that the conflict always going to be there between husband and wife, between two friends, between a, between a, in a witness, and uh, that creates the most impossible to perfect society. And look here, how many different opinions we have. And uh, somebody thinks perfect society is to take care of the poor. But I think perfect society is how not to create poor. How do we stop creating a poor people? That is the most important thing. And we are not focusing on that. We can stop creating a poor people by uh, uh, social engineering that you want to help poor people. We will, we, we, how many years, 1964, get a Civil Rights Act passed, okay? And after that, Jewish community grew, and the blacks did not. And we gave more money to black community free, and we made, we made a tremendous mistake. And mistake we made is that we should have given them the education, give, and that would have helped a lot, Instead, we give them the money. And then, the basic incentive to get better was lost. And it's going to be, and they did not have a good background to start with. 
along with this money, it just did not work. I, th I don't think in any society, when you give poor lots of money, it works. You've got to give poor incentive to get better, to stop things. Look, look, look at Protestants and, uh, and Catholics. Look, society, two, two societies are differences across the, when you take country by country. Protestant societies, it, they, they took uh, Martin Luther's uh, thing that if you have money, you are rich, you are better. You are chosen of the God. Catholics, they kept on looking for heaven through Pope. You know, Protestants had a very good incentive to get rich, to be chosen. And they did that. And in doing that, they hurt lots of people. They created colonialism. And lots of people got hurt. But this is the, this is the dynamic society works. Right now, India is very poor. Okay? And I have some, even with that, uh, what do you call it? Uh, some journalist with a loud mouth. Uh, I forgot his name. And he went to India and he said, do you know what he saw? The people were poor, but they took a stride. They were happy. See? And this is the difference. You do not have to be rich to be happy. You do not have to be, you can be poor and yet happy. Okay? Poor people, you get small food, you are happy. Oh, you, you get it. And they don't pollute. Right. Hello, I'm done? <laughs> no, you got, you still got another minute. Okay. And, and it, 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 lots of, lots, Bhutan, Bhutan is poor. And Bhutan is probably the happiest country right now in the world. Because their government took a definite stance that we are for happiness of the country and not everything else. Happiness is defined as the richness there. And the same way, we are not going, we are, America is not, never going to be, we are always going to be contentious, always going to be different, but we are getting better and better financially, economically. People are li living better. People are eating food. People are not hungry. People, more people are having a job now, and they are feeling better. Even in black and Hispanic community, people are having more job. But if you keep, you are going to have difficulty if you go to unrestricted immigration from Latin America right now. What we need is their well-educated immigrants. Okay, thank you. My time is up. Okay. Okay. Um, I went to here and get a little, little bit of food. All right. Yeah, you know, these poor countries, they live sustainably, actually. You don't need to look like a big fan of Americans. Okay, Charlie, don't interrupt me anymore. It's a warning. How fun would it be if Charlie didn't interrupt? Anyway, um, yeah. Tim, I'm sorry. When you watch this PBS special, you will come to the realization, it will shock you, that globalization is a complete, utter failure. And you're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. It has hollowed out the middle class we had auto workers making $20, $30 an hour or more with great benefits, and those jobs went to Mexico and China because of stupid politicians like Clinton and Reagan, name them. And Trump actually, he's not really good at this tariff stuff, I don't think, but he's kind of like, you know, taking a shot at it. So I kind of got to agree with Trump there a little bit on certain things. Anyway. Um, what I wanted to talk to you guys about was 9-11 was last week, we honored 9-11 and our war economy. And, um, you know, one thing about Germany, we started all these wars, right? Uh, let's see, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, name another one. Afghanistan. All oil wars, Afghanistan, Pakistan. So we're, you know, there's, I got a map if you guys all, all want to look at it. I emailed it out. So we're all in all these oil wars. And, and guess what wars? Charlie, one full at a time. We couldn't read your map. It wasn't. I will email me at US Bullet Train and I will get Gmail. Okay, so one thing about Germany, I'll tell you what, they accepted a million immigrants, 
But guess who caused all those immigrants? Guess what country? Syria. No. Who started all the oil wars? The American War Department. And big oil. Oh, come on, Tim. Are you like, see no evil, hear no, no. evil? So, I tell you what, Germany took in a million immigrants yes, the last couple of years, did. and America only takes in 50,000, and we're the ones that start all the bullshit. Yeah. We should be paying for all these immigrants since we started our oil wars there. It's disgusting. Syrian war started because there was a climate problem. The farmers came into the cities, they asked the government for some help, the dictator there did not respond, and he had no care or was so callous against the people, they started rising up against him. Once they rose up against him, he started firing on his own people in his own country, and he's been keeping it up ever since, and he's been st strengthened by the Russians and Iran. Because there's a lot of pipelines going through That's Syria. right. But at the same Pipeline, time, Russia ports, has a military base. Pumping, you know, all, all those countries are involved in oil. Okay, so... Uh, anyway, so watch that PBS special on Dayton. It's a shame how America's been, uh, union jobs have been hollowed out and the service economy turned into a complete failure, except for stupid Apple people in San Francisco in Silicon Valley. Who gives a damn about that crap? Okay, so um, one other thing I wanted to mention is no, I'd like to see another Mayor Daly. Run for for mayor. <laughs> you know what, that sucker. You know what? We'll find out about the meters because he's the one. He was the architect. <laughs> so we could have, ask him a lot of tough questions. That crook. And his and the rest of his daily. We family. need mayor Ricketts. Privatization. We need mayor Ricketts. No, well, we don't need stock bailed out stockbrokers running the city. Look what he did for the Cubs. If he could do it for Chicago, it would be a great it's thing. the Obama bailout bail park. It's all bailout money that built uh, Cubs Park. Okay, so, Charlie, thank you for shutting your pie hole. <laughs> <laughs> I took his right. place. Um, oh, you know, one thing I noticed about Trump, you know, I got familiarized with uh, Facebook. I always try to hand Andy to a Facebook page, but he always fights <laughs> me. Um, so I got familiarized with Facebook. I got f familiarized with uh, Twitter and all the twits on that. You know, if Trump, if he's going to use that platform all the, all the friggin' time, he even shows up on my phone once in a while, you know, if he's so sure about the data and information, there's a there's a little icon there where you could put it put up a map or a graph or a chart to prove his stupid points. But he never does. He just says <laughs> shit off the top of his head. So you know he's not telling the truth because he has no support, and no no backup on that. So that's, you know that's my opinion on his twit twi tweets. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, just uh, watch that PBS special on Dayton, Ohio. kind of tells you, you know, how globalization's a failure. And the service economy sucks. All right. right, Heather? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, next. Yeah. The service economy. Remember that 20 years ago? All right. A lot of things to, to say about the labor market for starting a stimulating conversation here. I want to get one little point off my chest right away. Electoral college. The electoral college is a problem for the Dems. It's why the Dems lost in 2008 and 2016. Whether you believe in the electoral college and the, the attempt to give a little more say to the smaller states, or you don't, uh, that's a discussion that will go on forever and ever. Most people around here live in a big state. So they say, well, let's get rid of the electoral college. But we did not lose in 2000 and 2016 because of the electoral college. We lost because of lazy-ass Democratic voters who sat on their ass on election day instead of going to the polls. That's why we lost in 2000 and in 2016. Uh, the biggest problem I think that we have is a high degree of contention in our government. And uh, it's actually amazing. I think it's. It's native to the system. It's amazing. We didn't have a lot more problems in earlier decades than we've had in the last couple of decades. I think most of the uh, uh, 
of the contention started in the age of uh, George W. Bush, and it's gotten worse ever since. Obama tried to be a little bit collegial, but that didn't work. The Republicans just tried to run over him, yeah. and he wouldn't be completely run over. So, you know, there's a lot of contention. Uh, and now it's even worse uh, with Trump. Uh, I think that the, the basic fault is the two-party system. I think we need more parties, as they have in Europe, because then uh, you, the, the parties have to develop coalitions uh, to get anything done. We're much too concentrating now on we win it or we lose it. There's nothing in between. And that's not the way our government should be. It should be collegial. It should be cooperation. Everybody gives a little and something gets done and we move forward. And uh, further uh, indication of how contentious we have become uh, goes to the Supreme Court. We look at the Supreme Court. Uh, whether you like Kavanaugh or not, if he wins, he's going he's gonna to win with a, a vote in the low 50s, 52 or 53 out of 100 senators. With uh, Sotomayor and, and Kagan back in Obama, they were somewhat contentious. Uh, they got uh, 63 and 68 votes, much, much less contentious. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg got 93 of 100, uh, Alito got 97 of 100, and Scalia got 98 of 100. And it wasn't that long ago, so it shows just how contentious the whole system uh, has gotten. Um, I agree with the whole notion of the imbalance of wealth in this country and how serious that is, how ridiculous it is. Uh, we have the greatest imbalance of wealth of any of the industrialized countries, uh, of the rich countries in the world by far. I mean, when you've got a guy like Rick Bezos, nothing against him personally, but he's worth somewhere between 112 and 160 billion dollars, depending on what day of the week it is, and, and who you count. And I think it takes pretty close to a billion dollars now to make the Fortune 400. And it certainly didn't uh, uh, the, of the richest individuals, and it, it didn't used to be that way. The wealth was more distributed. Now our system does, in fact, uh, use self-interest, uh, and there is a difference between selfishness and self-interest, uh, to create huge wealth, huge creativity, uh, new businesses, etc., etc., new products, new ideas. Uh, a lot of it is based on, on self-interest and the possibility of the individual gaining from that. Uh, we have become the, the richest society that has ever been seen on the planet. The problem is that wealth is not well distributed. We need to work on that. I have uh, always advocated a progressive income tax, I mean a really progressive income tax, going back to the uh, Eisenhower era brackets or more. Uh, also, a net worth tax uh, on a regular basis. We do have a net worth tax here in terms of real estate taxes, but there's so many people that are fighting real estate taxes, they think real estate taxes are an evil thing. Uh, I disagree with that. Uh, and there was a fellow here by the name of Rob Burns several years ago who had a plan for a one-time net worth tax. I didn't like the way he had it structured, but the concept of a one-time net worth tax to rebalance things a little would be good. Would we lose some people? Uh, would some people leave? Well, people always threaten to leave if taxes are going to go up in their jurisdiction. But uh, in point of fact, only a very small percentage do whether we're talking about American states that raise taxes, or whether we talk countries in Europe, most people stay where they are because that's where they want to be and that's where they want to have uh, their businesses. Now there are there are people, for example, here in Illinois will, who will establish their official residence in Florida because there's no income tax down there, but uh, this is a relatively uh, small effect. The other thing we need is a substantial, uh, I'll defer to the Republicans here, Call what they call it, a substantial death tax. When people die, uh, in my opinion, very little financial wealth should be passed on to their kids. Because in fact, people who are wealthy, their kids have advantages already. They've probably got a good education, they've got a good uh, a series of friends that they can deal with, and they're probably fairly smart too and clever because that's how their parents got rich. Uh, unless, of course, uh, we're talking about money that's been right. passed down from generation to generation. Uh, and Tim is dead wrong. Globalization is not a failure. But failure from whose point of view? Uh, most Americans benefit 
uh, from globalization because we can buy more goods for less money than we could before. And who says okay. that Americans are the only ones that get to have uh, a middle class? Uh, uh, and all these other countries, their, their workers should remain poor. That's ridiculous. They are, they're entitled okay. to share in the wealth as well. Thank you. Very good. When you're ready, we'll start. Go ahead. Okay. Do, do I get nine minutes too? He had six. Okay. Actually, six fifteen. But uh, I'm okay. not. Okay. Um, so uh, two things I wanted to say. Not sure if I'll have enough time to say both. But the first one I wanted to do is respond to uh, Andy got up and during the announcements phase talked about AIDS, and uh, he talked, brought brought up this new this book. It's a reissue of an old book, and one of the points that he made was a point he said to me when I was sitting with him. This new edition has 20 forwards, forwards from 20 different doctors, okay, in a book that basically challenges the idea of AIDS, and I'm trying to be an open-minded person, took the book, and I looked through it. And the first looked at the forward, and the first person I looked at has a little description of the person at the end of, the, of what they wrote, and they weren't a doctor. Okay, so I go to the second person in the list. They're not a doctor either. And I took the time to go through all through those 20 doctors that Andy claims that they are, and out of the 20, there are five that are MDs. <laughs> Andy's looking at the book right now. Uh oh. So you know this is the kind this is the kind of stuff that really makes me sad and, and, and a little frustrated because there are there's a tremendous amount of energy that's needed to fight about legitimate issues, <laughs> legitimate conspiracies that are going on in Washington and in Springfield and in Chicago, and talking about AIDS is just a sidetrack. So that's my first thing. My second point is that um, I. I uh, I respectfully would point out to the speaker that uh, I, I think that the premise of her talk was um, kind of uh, self-defeating because I think that uh, cr clearly striving for perfection is impossible. But that being said, I think it's a great topic to talk about selfishness. Um, it made me think of one of the first things she talked about where people are living together. I'm not sure if you said it was, uh, you were talking about a condominium situation. Yeah, yeah, so I know, I've know i known a lot of people with condos who have complained about a very similar issue, and that is that you have this condo, everybody's supposed to run things, but nobody actually wants to do the work. They're always fighting about, okay, well, who's going to be president now, and then they end up finding some guy who's kind-hearted who does it for three or four years, and then they disappear, and then work doesn't get done. And I just thought that's kind of a great uh, a small example of what I think happens in government is you have a lot of people complaining about what's going on, but there just seems to be this lack of civic mindedness, and the people who are most motivated to get the power are the ones who are doing it for selfish reasons. So um, I was lucky enough to meet Paul Simon, and I think Paul Simon was a guy who just had this enormous amount of respect on both sides of the aisle as a guy who, uh, even if you didn't believe in his values, you, you really felt like he was trying to do the right thing, trying to find a way to do the right thing. Um, and I remember when he said he wasn't going to run anymore, and he said, it's because I have to spend most of my time raising money. So what's up with this society where we have kids starting out at an early age looking at all the wrong values, and, and they don't, I, how do you teach kids civic mindedness? Do we inject it through the school system? Because otherwise they're just going to look for instant gratification and superficial ways of trying to momentarily attain happiness. And uh, I just wish there was a recognition that our, our culture and our media pushes people in a superficial direction and some way to try to steer that towards a more civic-minded approach and look at the, the pleasure and the value and, and the real happiness be, behind helping your fellow man. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. All right, go ahead. Just get up there. Well, he was thinking that.
First of all, with regard to what Margaret said about the Democrats, I'm sorry, folks. I am a proud Chicago and Cook County Democrat, and I have no objection to the spending of money to, if it's to help people and if it's for legitimate purposes. Secondly, with regard to the Electoral College, some folks got it confused. It was not Rutherford B. Hayes. It was Benjamin Harrison who, in 1888, was elected with a majority in the Electoral College, but who did not have a majority in the popular vote. That went to his predecessor, Grover Cleveland. Ironically, four years later, the same two men faced each other, the only time in American history that the incumbent president has had as his opposition the president who preceded him. And that president, Cleveland, won that time. Uh, what happened with Rutherford B. Hayes was no candidate got a majority in the Electoral College, and as a result, a deal was cut between the Hayes forces and the South so that Congress would give the Electoral College vote to Hayes in return for taking federal troops out of the South, ending Reconstruction, and putting a Southerner in, in Hayes' cabinet. Uh, with regard to some of the heckling that went on earlier, all I have to say to that is something that I have said before. Sorry, Charlie, only the best tasting tuna get to be star kissed. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. All right. Okay. My name is David Rubin, and, and I am glad that Mr. Charlie Paydock um, let me go first, but this means that he's just going to have um, the opportunity to criticize whatever I have to say. Now, if this, if this honorable gentleman would like to do that. But actually, I do want to make first one point about something that was raised um, about uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Now, I have not followed the news in the last few days, but from what I see, uh, the the honorable judge has um, it done uh, some inappropriate things in high school. And I'm almost 60 years old for the next few days, and I admit that in my lifetime, I have done inappropriate things too. And, 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 and there are other people in a few days on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement in the Jewish religion, who will admit the same. Now, on another topic, um, uh, there, there's been quite a bit of talk tonight about Adam Smith, who actually uh, held views that became a great part of the United States. He's mostly known for one book, and that, of course, is The Wealth of Nations. Right. Um, in, uh, in, oddly enough, in the year 1776. Mm -hmm. However, in, now that book, you would, in reading, you would think he's talking rather a lot about selfishness. Now, Mr. Smith also wrote a book, Theory of Moral Sentiments, if I have, the, if I have that correct. It correct. And I believe that was in, in three volumes. Yep. And years ago, when I, when I thought I was a better student, I did read both of those books. And in the latter book, Theory of Moral Sentiments, um, Mr. Adam Smith was, did not come across as someone so interested in selfishness. He did come across as someone more open-minded right. and more interested in the community. So um, there, there are many parts to this, and I do think that Margaret Goldstein has touched on many of them that do deserve further discussion. Thank you. And now, Mr. Charlie Peta. <laughs> All right, Charlie. Well, thank you. I'll get to go yeah, after you and nice. criticize you this very time. Very nice introduction there. My good friend David, good to see you again, young man. And happy birthday. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual here. First of all, I'd like to thank our speaker, Margaret, for giving us a lot of, a lot to cover here. I, you know, I'm sorry I asked you some tough questions, but you know, that's the college, lady. <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, how do we get a perfect society? I, I begin, I think you have to look at the basic fundamental unit of any society is the interaction. And is that in interaction among equals? Is it a free interaction or a constrained interaction here? 
uh, regarding selfishness or, I, or, or this, this concept that society best is best by everyone acting in their own self-interest is possibly one of the most nonsensical concepts that could have been ever expounded. Uh, everyone acting for themselves selfishly is somehow beneficial. In the prehistory of the world, the human species succeeded because they joined together and acted collectively. It's been in particular, some activities, they had the benefit of verbal communication, but they hunted together and gathered together and shared as a society. And anybody, that's why you have, no one exists in isolation. And tribalism came in, the family, the tribe, the clan, and to say, to come along later, centuries later, and to say, well, no, everyone acting in their own self-interest is the best thing to do, meant had that happened, the human species would not have survived to the present day. They realized the utilitarian benefits of acting collectively together. Anyone could perceive that, and if they didn't, now you're telling me the isolated hunter did better than those who shared collective meals of a larger beast that they could they could kill collectively? It does, that's not the case. It doesn't exist in any primitive society today. Okay, now I also mentioned, the thing that really concerns me is not these entitlements, which seem to have some sort of imperfections, but the disparity between the rich and the poor. The fact of the matter is, you have a lot of people who do less and less and are getting more and more. That doesn't seem to concern Margaret Terry much. She's just concerned about some of these entitlements, which the Republicans are yelling about now, having given themselves a very generous tax, tax cut. They're saying, well, they wake up and they're rude and say, well, oh my, you need to mention this, that there is an increasing deficit. Why is there an increasing deficit? Because those who have more are contributing less. Yeah. Now these things make life a little bit easier for some people, and I don't have any real problem with that. And this thing, Raj, that a poor person who hasn't eaten for a week gets a little bit of food and is therefore happy, doesn't make poverty happy, you know. That's a sense. That's the only thing. I don't even want to talk about that. That's nuts. Uh, the other thing is that there are no incentives whatsoever to do anything in a collective society or a collective operation. No, I'm in a union. And we do almost everything we do is to collectively improve the conditions of employment of the employees. And I've been doing that for decades. And to say that there's no incentive, it makes the union better and stronger, and it makes our, our accomplish our goals. So what do you mean there's no incentive? To do, yes, the most assuredly there is. Now last of all, um, well, the other thing is Tim was kind of right in a sense. So immediately this notion came along that the small business person is somehow the greatest element in, in a societal structure. And you couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> That's absolutely nonsensical. It's conceivably one of the most detrimental aspects. If anything, globalization puts this whole concept of all these independent entrepreneurs uh, to rest as being inefficient and not the way to go about it. Um, that's, that's really laid to rest. And that we, you need small businesses is the only way a society can function? No. This, this is the only conceivable method through which a society can operate and provide much needed goods and services? No, you can do it collective. It can be provided at any level. It could be provided at a max, maximum level to the entire society through legislative efforts. 
And then there's many examples of that existing. Not at the micro level. That's, that's not great. Now, last of all, I'd like to talk here. How much time have I got, Timmy? Uh, I got to talk about this Greek guy who retired with a million dollars. Well, where did Charlie. the million dollars come from? Maybe it came from the people who worked in his business. And he didn't pay any money to them, you know. He paid them a dollar a day. So he started accruing his money. Well, maybe he, maybe those people had to work under sunsafe working conditions. Uh, maybe he cheated them. Did they get any retirement? What happened to them? Are they retiring on some Greek island? Or are they living in some homeless shelter in the park? Okay. What are, what are we talking about here? So I got, this is the ideal, that's what I mean. I'm giving this situation here, the ideal model is this Greek guy <laughs> who made a million dollars. Who knows how he made it? He didn't make it. A whole bunch of people made it and he kept it. <laughs> that's what happened. Now if you have one of that kind of happened to you, now there's only one little Greek guy, and I imagine there's a whole bunch of guys who made that Greek guy rich. And if you want to be one of the whole bunch of them guys who make some guy rich, then you can get into this libertarian free market capitalism. And good luck, my friend. Anyhow, thank you very much, Margaret. Good to see you again. All right, thank you. it's my turn. It's my turn. Okay, it's my there. turn. Yeah. <laughs> I'll follow you then. All right then. The problem is, Charlie, as usual, you're dead wrong. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> not news. And it's not out of the, from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from each from their regard to their own self-interest. Okay. They wouldn't get up and go to work if they didn't get some kind of reward for it. And the other thing that you got to understand, man is an animal that makes bargains. No other animal does this. No dog exchanges bones with another. Also from Adam Smith. And here's something else too. Uh, hey, uh, hang on. There's something else, too. If I can just get there. Anyway, Adam Smith was probably one of the most prolific thinkers that we've had in the last 300 years or so. He was the one who came up with the basic model of how to run an economy. His book on uh, the wealth of nations time. goes extensively into rents goes extensively into trade, goes extensively into things like GN, and, you know, just the basic things that, that people do. And he explained that a lot of it was done out of their own self-interest, not because of their benevolence towards one another. They exchanged goods and services so that they could survive. And if you go anywhere around the world, there's a thriving marketplace. The point of the matter is, is that sometimes capitalism gets out of whack and becomes what Smith calls mercantilism. And that's kind of what we have now in the United States with a whole bunch of people at the top controlling all the wealth and nobody else getting by and trying to get to them. There is a solution though, because we've been here before. Right at the beginning of World War I, before Roosevelt got in office, there was something called trusts and trust busting and a thousand people controlling the economy of the United States. Ten. He, huh? Ten. Ten? Well, anyway, he came up with a plan called trust busting. He took a lot of these large corporations and uh, divided them up. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, some of the richest men in the world got even richer because of the dividends of their multiple holdings. Oh, that's a good idea. But the thing, point of the matter was, he introduced the element of competition and there was a lot of people upset because the corporations weren't paying enough. And there were some capitalists involved who then said, hey, why don't we pay them more? Particularly Henry Ford with his uh, revolutionary ideas on this stuff. Because Adam Smith also said, too, that 
If the majority of the society is poor and miserable and can't make it, that society is not going to last very long. So what I'm going to say is this. I like capitalism. I think it's the best way to create wealth. We're a lot better off trading amongst the nations than fighting amongst the nations. Both and the thing choice. is, if a country, can, if a country can do better making one thing, they're going to be much better off and highly more profitable and successful if they can then do it. If you have a socialized economy, Charlie, you're going to go backwards. And that's been proven time and time again. Are you telling me it's either capitalism Can I or hear the speaker, please? The no, point shut up, Charlie, the you shut up! Ooh, 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 ooh. All right. You see, Charlie, that's exactly what I'm saying. If you're socialist ideas, and I mean, there, there has to be some, at, at least today, we all agree that there are some things that need to be universal. Health care, unemployment insurance, some of the other things the government provides to help the poor and needy, you know, maybe they might not be as managed properly, but they do help. I've been on unemployment before and it certainly came with some great benefits. I was looking for a job at the time and it was nice to have a little bit of an income to keep going for a while instead of being just thrown out on the street. Also too, um, I'm with the VA, I get my medical care basically for free, uh, and it's a, it's a good system. And it might be better if we did something like that in the, in the rest of the states. They were efficient, they were smooth, they have, at least for me, they've been, it's been a very overall good, positive experience. But again, if we want these benefits, we're also going to have to be taxed for them. And if we want to be like Sweden, we're going to be paying a 56% of our income in income tax. If we want a society that's every man for himself, we pay 10%. But again, it's what we want as a society. I think it's a balance. I think we're maybe getting a little bit, with the Republican administration currently, we're getting a little bit too, uh, near, near do I say, selfish in our own ambitions. Meaning that uh, there's been too much control in the business, in the large corporations getting the tax breaks and not the small ones. I'll say it again, and if I've not said it before, globalization and capitalism have produced the greatest wealth and flowering in human history. 300 years ago, almost every nation was poor. They were had the, the, the castles on the serfs and the generally agrarian farmers. Now, those people are much more prosperous. Even the poor in our country still have TVs and refrigerators and a, a basic standard of living that would be like a rich man 300 years ago and around the world around the world we're seeing we could in the next 20 years we could see an end to abject poverty where people are losing less than a dollar a day it's been proven because you can see it in the statistics just look at a book by Johann Norberg called human happiness and human advancement the point of the matter is we're not going to stop this march towards the world getting to be a better place. It can be stopped if all of a sudden we start having these tariff wars. We need trade. We need prosperity. We need capitalism. We need a little bit of the safety net behind these things. And yes, I am not unreasonable, but sorry, communism don't work. Uh, socialism in its pure form don't work. What works is dem democratic capitalism, and what stops it is when people do not take their chance and go out and vote for the society they want. So I'm in agreement with one thing with you, Charlie. We all need to be involved. Even though we have divergent views, we all need to be involved. We all need to be taken care of. I mean, we all need to exercise our citizenship responsibilities, and whether we be selfish or not, we also have to respect the rights of the other guy, too, and his self-interest. Thank you.
We wouldn't want to make them think that. All right, Andy, go ahead. No, no, that, it, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Let me grab yeah. it from you. We're going to have to pay taxes. The corporations. All right. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's out of power now, Andy, so time yourself, okay? But we'll, 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 we'll. Hello. Can everybody hear me back there? I'm sorry, I got a time right here. Go ahead. My name is Andy Anderson. Uh, most of you know me. I've been giving talks at the college since 2007, uh, really when the restaurants became non-smoking. Because I'm allergic to cigarette smoke, so I couldn't be a member of the college for all those years. People were puffing away during dinner. <clears throat> but uh, for the last 30 years or so, my brother and I have run an information service. We call it the Northwest Information Service, and we translate books. And uh, I'd like to address a, a couple of comments. Um, my uh, the fellow I've been going to a long time, Barber, he's just recently retired. He came into uh, meet us for lunch the other day, and we were talking about the Catholic Church syndrome, wherein many, many people in the Catholic Church, individual churches, they collectively, they failed to look at the evidence that they had a priest abusing their kids in the church. It's six percent of priests. That's the the worldwide average, and it's, it's agreed upon. It's not a debatable issue. But the Catholic Church syndrome, it, it, it deals with the psychology of why people won't face reality that's right in front of their face. Because uh, in many cases, you have to step through the psychological barrier that prevents you from looking at the evidence. Once you get on the other side of the barrier, the evidence is very easy to understand. Professor Griffin has said many times, once you step through the psychological barrier, you can understand the evidence on 9-11. All you need is a 30% open mind and a seventh grade education. The, and all you need to do is be able to distinguish between numbers two and number seven. Seven buildings were destroyed by pre-placed explosives on 9-11. And all in the same day, seven buildings were leveled. The media filmed the first two and they sold it as a terrorist attack. 9-11 was essentially, as many Hollywood uh, producers are saying now, 9-11 looked like a scripted Hollywood movie that was sold to produce just like a movie. That's how it was sold to the American people. That's how the rest of the world looks at it. Now, uh, but I'm not here to talk about that tonight. I was here, uh, a gentleman mentioned that uh, I did slightly misrepresent this book when I said there were 20 doctors in the 20 prefaces. There, there, are, there are journalists, uh, world famous investigative reporters. Each of these 20 introductions summarizes the work of world famous doctors, some of them with Nobel Prize credentials. This whole book, Positively False, Exposing the Myths Around HIV and AIDS, it's a summary of what doctors have learned since 1987. And for those of you that think there's one or two people with an opinion, you can log on to a site called Virus Myth. Virusmyth.com. You'll find the home, it's the home site, the website of the scientific group to reappraisal of AIDS. A picture Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends from the physics department sending a letter to the president saying, Mr. President, we'd appreciate it if you stop saying the Earth is flat at your press conference. We got pictures from the space shuttle. Well, what are you going to do about Albert and his friends? 500 physicists with lifelong credibility in physical sciences when they're publishing the database, the Earth is round. There's no debate on this. Anybody that says he's flat is terrifyingly ignorant. Terrifying ignorance, that's the term. And the media in America maintains the majority of American citizens in a bubble of terrifying ignorance. The rest of the world is familiar with this book. It's a worldwide bestseller. Professor Peter Duisberg was on his way to a Nobel Prize as a, for cancer research and virus research. Duisberg was recognized in 1987 as the number one virus expert on the planet. He blew the whistle on him. He published an article in one of the cancer journals. He said, oh, by the way, I just thought you'd like to know HIV is harmless. That's one of 50 harmless retroviruses that don't cause any kind of illness. They don't be people sick. He said, my lab hasn't looked into it yet. We haven't studied it yet, why these people are getting sick. But we can tell you that's not it. And five years later, they published the hypothesis that turned out to be true. 
what many people suspected from the start, that the cause of AIDS in the United States, especially in the gay community, the cause was massive overuse of recreational drugs. It was never the HIV virus. In Africa, AIDS was caused by starvation and malnutrition. And up until 1983, those people were classified as having diseases related to starvation and malnutrition. But when they developed the bogus HIV test, they started classifying people stamping their medical records positive to develop a market for the very expensive AIDS drugs. It's the largest, most embarrassing, fraudulent medical crime in human history. And that is uh, the AIDS, the, the site I told you about is one of several. The scientific group for reappraisal, reappraisal of AIDS, the updated information is, is in the Alberta Reappraising AIDS Society. That's where they, it's active and they publish uh, weekly and uh, you know monthly articles, updates from yeah. all over the world on like how other countries, other countries have put an end to the AIDS epidemic. As of 2008 for other countries, it was over. And the World Health Organization says, there's no heterosexual AIDS epidemic. We're sorry, we made a mistake. That's 2008, 10 years ago. Charlie, you had a question? You, you still, yeah, I was in Washington. You still think I'm practicing medicine without a license yes, up here? Yes, sir, I do. I was in Washington when they had this thing called the AIDS quilt on the mall. Yeah, I, I, was, I was there, too. I was there, and too, Charlie. And all those people died, and you saying they all died of recreational drugs? No, that's not what I said. You just said that 10 minutes to one I did. Diet. Charlie, pull your head out of your ass. I said this to you many times. Uh, you got to pull it out of the air now. Let us see the light of day every now. What are they doing? Open your eyes and look. Now listen, I will tell you exactly. Those people, <laughs> all the people that were dying uh, in 1987, when people started dying in droves, it was because they were being fed a fatal chemotherapy drug in capsules that had been renamed an antiviral drug by the drug company Burroughs Welcome. The uh, Burroughs Welcome, their internal documents show, they said when we put this drug on the market and start marketing to people that supposedly have AIDS, it's going to be 100% fatal. There will be no survivors, and we're going to make billions in the process. And true to their word, everybody that took that medicine from the AIDS doctors, they all died. It was 100% fatal because the only people that survived, Charlie, were the ones that stopped taking it because it was a fatal chemotherapy poison that stopped the growing cells all over the body. Chemotherapy that stops the growing cells until a faster cancer, cancer growing cells die off. Nobody takes that kind of chemo four times a day for the rest of your life. Several doctors have said it's flat out that poison for humans. And you go downhill and die in 12 to 18 months. And that's what we saw. And the gay community went along with this saying, all oh, these people are dying of AIDS and it, because they, they did not want to admit or question the gay lifestyle of massive recreational drug use party. And so uh, other countries have corrected this. Other countries have saved hundreds of thousands of lives of people that didn't die. So the ne next time you criticize me about a book, crack a book yourself. This is one of 40 that I read and digested from thousands of doctors on AIDS. I'm not up here practicing medicine by you know, uh, without a license. I'm telling you what thousands of doctors are saying all over the world. Okay? So don't keep bragging at me for saying it's my opinion. It's yeah, not. It is. It's it's the earth is round. Smoking four packs a day is bad for your health, and HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Those are three facts that are documented beyond debate. You're okay. like saying chemotherapy kills people, but cancer doesn't. I did not say that. Again, you gotta pull it out the air out, Charlie. You gotta pull your head out of your ass every now and then and stop making these arguments. All right. All right. All right. Raj Patel has requested one minute. Raj wants to come back. He wants requested one minute, so go ahead, Raj. There are gun artists and snake oil salespeople, and Andy Anderson is one of them when it comes to age issues. He has a no credibility. The Center for Disease hey, Control. John, Raj, 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 you don't get a chance to do it. I got a chance to speak. Well, I got a chance to slander people here. I do. Okay, listen, I'm listen. If, you, if you're going to slander people, okay, okay, I'm, 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 I'm not going to let you do that. My apology, I'll go on. I'm not going to let you do that. My apology, I'll go on. You have the right to slander No, because you, 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 you do week after week no, after week. You guys. sell your propaganda here, and that is not right. Everybody has a right here, but you don't. Nobody has a right here to promote that. Now. And I think Tim Walter and that guy there, it is their mistake. They let this happen. 
There is nobody has a right to our propaganda week after week after week for such a sensitive issue and it's such a wrong thing. What he said has a no basis in the center of disease control or a government drug administration. Everybody has said in the United Nations, everybody, there is no proof there and we keep on hearing every single goddamn thing. Hmm. It's a sick. You know, if we let anything go on, let the Trump is an angel. Trump is not doing anything different when he excludes people. I mean, come on, guys, wake up. We have a rule. You know, we we have a rules and we have a, and we have a open discussion forum, but we do not have propaganda. We have, yeah. we have a rule at the college, and Raj has just given us a classic example of that rule: one fool at a time and there's supposed to be no personal attacks. Personal you don't come up with this fight and personal personal attack. attack people verbally. It couldn't and of course, <laughs> it's, easy to, it's easy to shoot the messenger when you don't understand the information that's being given. Well, I, compl I completely agree with Raj. What you're saying is a pile of junk with the AIDS epidemic. <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't cracked the book either, have you? Yes, I have. I, I cracked the book that you I've showed looked, me. I looked you at said the there woman here dead wrong. doctors that wrote the 9 board. 9-11 was done by 12 terrorists. Yeah, you're right, not even reading the book that you're quoting. I said I misspoke. I said it's a right, summary. Man. It's a summary of the work of 20 doctors among hundreds of others. We can, we can accept that, Andy, but it just... I know, I've been looking at some of your evidence, and I'm can fully you know, convinced. You're right evidence, because if you, you, you keep standing in a blizzard of facts, a blizzard of evidence claiming you can't see a single snowflake, then that's not a credible stance for uh, an intelligent adult. You know, it is a credible stance. Okay, you want, you, you, well, no, we're doing a second round. Oh, there is a second round. We, we got a little time. If you want to go for another minute, we'll let you go for another minute. He's, he's up, sure. he hasn't spoken yet, so he gets Come on. five. Come on. Normally there's not a second round, but Raj just requested it. We have a little time. If you want to go for another minute, no problem. We got a couple more speakers involved, let's let them go. Okay, go, please, go ahead. My apologies. Yes. Many thanks, um, Electoral College has been mentioned here. I'm uh, just going to add a few words to it. I really believe it should be abolished. How many of you feel that it should be abolished? The majority. The Electoral College. Since 1700, there were. <laughs> quite a few propositions to abolish it, and the total proposition is 700. So I guess we won't have a chance to abolish that stuff. Mm, somebody mentioned about, actually it was one of the founder fathers, I don't remember his name, that said that uh, democracy usually lasts about 200 years on the average. As soon as the people find out how they can vote, the public coffers to themselves, the things that are going down. I don't know whether it's the truth, but many people believe that. And why are we rich? Nobody has mentioned the causes why we are so prosperous and the rest of the world is in the dumps. And I think Carl Sagan said it one of his TV programs. Uh, you're too young to remember that. <laughs> um, he, he's, he attributed to three things, and, and I strongly believe it. One is that uh, we got the richest land that we took away from the Indians. And another we acquired a lot of brilliant minds from all over the world. And the third, what an unquote, we exploit other countries. You can deny it. So far as AIDS is concerned, one little word about AIDS. 
when it first started in 79 actually 80 um, there were some cases we were baffled at uh, we had some young people that had fever and lymphadenopathy big nodes lymph nodes and uh, it was a puzzle until we discovered later by 82 that it was a virus and since then we've been really improving on our on our retroviral drugs it comes to the point where you nowadays you can come across a patient that will say i'm cured my t cells are 250 that's pretty normal so they feel like they are cured if they were cured, uh, Big Pharma wouldn't be too happy because they have to produce the drugs over and over and sell it to you every month. And why is that they are not cured? Anybody? It's because some of the virus stays in healthy cells. The virus really, you, you, you are carrying viruses right now in your nerves around your mouth. It usually it's, when it activates, it comes out like a cold sore. But, but then your immune system develops sufficient antibodies to control it and it remains dormant there. We have a lot of viruses like that in our bodies and we live with them. And so the, unfortunately, the eight virus seeks the refuge in the DNA of your cells. In fact, for a virus to replicate itself, it has to use the DNA, your DNA, to repl replicate itself. Otherwise, it will not go any place. Okay, that's, I thought I will say a couple of words. Thanks. Okay. Last rebuttal, you got five minutes, sir. Okay, let's uh, let let's let let another speaker uh, go ahead, Margaret, sir. Margaret, I think you gave a good talk, and I appreciate hearing everybody's uh, comments. And you say a perfect society is impossible. That's not true. A perfect society is coming, but there are going to be a lot of storms before that society arrives. And what we've gone through in the past is a Sunday school picnic compared to what's coming. And Margaret, you said there's nothing you can do. There's something that you can do, and it's the most powerful thing that you can do, and that is to pray. Prayer consists of three parts. You're talking, most important, you're listening to God, and then doing what he tells you to. Remember PLO. Pray, listen, and obey, and if we all do that, society's problems are going to be solved. But if we continue living selfishly, you're going to find there's a lot of trouble coming. And Jesus is going to have to come back to straighten it out. And time is a lot shorter than you think it is. Thank you. All right. hey. I'll get a little out, Andy. Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret, you got it. Please go ahead, Margaret, you get the last word. Last word. All right, Margaret, you got the, you got the final stray. Thank you. All right. I'm joining out, Margaret. She's got it. Uh, there were many, many comments. It's hard to, to um, respond to all of them. Um, they, they don't, the thing going back to several... Uh, he, turned the, he turned the sound down, so just keep talking. Can I just stand out here and talk? Or, well, Grab the mic and we can go right ahead. Just un just no, no, it's, it's stuck on here. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, all right. All right. Yes. Uh, I was, um, uh, that in uh, following self-help, 
uh, you're always um, benefiting other people. For example, if you start a business in the course of it, and that, of course, could be true. But what I've always been trying to say, and I couldn't think of the word, but now I've thought of the word, is to constrain your self-help efforts by the effect on others. If it's helping others, wonderful. But if it's not, like the food industry, then it's not. And I don't care if the food industry is providing jobs or whatever. If they're providing jobs that are hurting people, they're wrong. Now, I am, um, I am whoever said that, I forgot, that I'm pragmatic. That's right. The difference between myself and some folks around here is that I am not ideological. I don't start with an ideology and try to have all the events fit into that ideology. I start with the facts and form an opinion. Uh, somebody said, uh, try to learn from other countries. I agree. Uh, I think better ways of doing things. Ethical artificial intelligence, I don't think it's even here now, but uh, Doug was talking about. Uh, I, I thought artificial intelligence was something to be scared of. I'm no expert, but I thought it was being used for things like taking jobs away from others and limiting jobs and so forth. So that's that. Uh, somebody mentioned a net worth work tax. I don't really agree with that. It might discourage saving. But I do agree that the estate tax should be brought back. At the federal level, Republicans went to, well, even the Democrats went out against this and it's just almost eliminated. So that you have to have a huge estate. I forgot the figures. I think it was $5 million or whatever, a huge estate to pay anything. It's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. That's the most, I would say, the most painless tax you could have. Who's going to be harmed? And we need the money. Um, globalization is not a, is not a failure. No, it really is not. And as Tim, guess what you said, is the greatest creator of that and capitalism of um, prosperity of anything we that's done. Uh, we need our energy for legitimate issues. So let's not waste our energy on conspiracy theories and such. Um, let's see. Sorry, I can't read my handwriting. <laughs> uh, well, Adam Smith. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, the, the other side. He wrote the, the, another book. The theory of moral separation. And um, that acting collectively, oh, we never, history would have never gotten going if we hadn't acted, co acted collectively. Right. Um, just doing something. And um, um, listen, listen. now, somebody says, speaking of the wealthy, just making more and more money, doing less and less. It isn't quite like that. I resent the explaining wealth and this and that and the CEOs. The fact is, those folks work much more than the rest of us. I've seen, oh. I've seen that they're working 12-hour days or whatever. It's nothing to them. Yeah. So you've got to remember that. I mean, there is some pain that goes along with that wealth. Oh, yeah. Now, also try to remember that many, many ordinary Americans pay no income. About The figure is somewhere about 40-45% of American households pay no federal income tax. Just remember that. Both sides. Unions, collective effort. Yes, they're a collective effort, but then they're also in on themselves, regardless of the effect of their actions. Yes, they're benefiting their little group, but harming everybody else. Look at the teachers <laughs> union. The teachers union in Chicago is a horror story. Because they are so bad. And they, and not just in Chicago, everywhere, they say that they're so bad that when it comes to seniority, if you, if you are no way, if it comes to seniority, and you're a math teacher, and they have no ring for an English teacher, you will be chosen to teach the English class that you don't know anything about. It's bad, bad, bad. It's nothing to do with the welfare of the kids. Um, you want people to uh, work for nothing? All right, that's enough. You can have Give me a Humans, all right. Adam Smith, get up.
talking yeah. about self-interest, uh, and mercantilism was when you get into monopolies. And monopolies are getting to be, and this was the concentration of industry, it was brought up, and this is a problem in this country, and I was even reading today in Britain, yep. a similar country, and that really harms us. We do not want um, concentration because if prices can rise, it's just not a good thing of industry. Uh, if you want, uh, Okay. Yes. Now this is the thing somebody brought up, and I've thought of saying it so many times. People say, "Oh, we want the um, this benefit and that benefit and food stamps and whatever they are." Yes, but you know what? One of the big reasons I'm against those things is because we go into debt to pay it. Now, as somebody said, in Sweden, these people have the cradle to the grave thing, but they're willing to pay the taxes to support it. Now, if you want all these things, then you've got to be willing to pay the taxes for it. Uh, we all need to be uh, involved. That's right. And somebody was saying that uh, my example of the co-op building was similar to the was the sort of example to the average person to become civically involved, so that we can put these politicians, uh, you know hold their feet to the fire. Um, and um, globalization capitalism I've already said Okay. That's all. Very good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Real quick I want to thank Charlie and Andy for helping out tonight a little bit. It's still because of Charlie's efforts to book these speakers coming in here that we're still a viable organization and in existence. So let's give a hand to Charlie real quick. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. And then those union that's and all that are. And, and uh, I'd also like to give another shout out to Andy for also giving us a hand tonight with collecting the dues and stuff. Even though we disagree a lot, there is a large I know too that I feel proud that Priest put these on the on the web. One more thing. Just so you guys know, tomorrow I'll be in Springbrook Community Church worshiping Jesus as my Savior and God. And I'll be under, under one of the pastors. Anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. I want to again thank you for supporting this institution. And with that, the College of Complex is adjourned. Take it, take it.